This is Tim. This is Patrick. And this is Deconstructing Comics. Oh, did you just write me a message? Okay. <laughs> Welcome to Deconstructing Comics, sponsored by ComicsNow.com. Uh, this week I'm on Skype with Patrick W., and we thought we'd do a Marvel geek out here. We haven't done one of these in almost a year. Um, although I suppose part of the reason we don't do it too often is just because uh, we're kind of behind in our reading compared to uh, to readers in the States. Um, <clears throat> I get my comics uh, f uh, through, of course, Comics Now, our sponsor. Uh, uh, once a month, they send me a box. And Patrick, I guess you are you still buying at uh, at where Blister or? Yeah, I've got to wait till they come out here, and uh, I often end up doing a lot of uh, borrowing from other comic fans in town. Mm, I see. You actually know other comic fans in town. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel I feel kind of well. I live sort of farther out of Tokyo, and I feel kind of isolated out here. the The comic shop that Patrick goes to is too you know, too far away for me to go there very often, and also it's pretty pretty pricey, isn't it? Yeah, and it just and uh, just doesn't have the selection that it used to have. They mm. they had a really nice shop for a while, but they really. I think they tried too hard, and they got a really nice, posh location, selling uh, all kinds of figures and toys and, you know, character goods and that kind of thing. And now they're they had to move out to some small dinky location. Oh really? The comic, really? yeah, the comic corner is just pitiful. Mm. It's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so the uh, kind of focus of Marvel recently has been Secret Invasion. Um, I've, at this point, read up to issue seven of the eight, and you said you'd read up to just I'm up to five. Number five, okay. But I've I've also read quite a few of the uh, ancillary issues as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Um, New Avengers and Mighty Avengers have had a lot of kind of backstory or side things going on, or kind of explanations of filling out the stories of various things that are going on in the main series. Right. Um, <clears throat> and, I don't know, some of them have been pretty good, and others have been kind of... I didn't quite get the point. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, the uh, since a lot of the story seems to be talking about stuff that already happened in the past, mm -hmm. it's hard to be as excited about it. You know, it's like, oh, okay, that's how that happened, and okay. <laughs> you know, it's not, you know, you want to know what's more about what's going on now. And uh, I'm sure they're having fun mm -hmm. explaining all the, you know, all the back stuff. And I guess that's what the uh, all the side issues should be about, and that lets the main, you know, the main story stay in the main book. Mm -hmm. Now, although... Uh, um, I don't know if you've read uh, yet uh, Mighty Avengers 19. <clears throat> uh, the whole thing was about um, Marvel Boy, um, a character who I'm really not acquainted with at all. And it never even uh, identifies him by name, and I was kind of scratching my head through the whole thing. <laughs> and then... Just now, before we got on, <clears throat> I was going back through the issues of Secret Invasion, and I realized that he'd appeared in there several times, uh, briefly, uh, briefly enough that uh, it didn't even really make an impression on me. Right. <laughs> but he has a whole one page in the first issue of Secret Invasion, um, and it it mentions in the caption in issue one that he is a convicted alien terrorist and current master of the Cube, the, cube. the Maximum Security Penitentiary. I right, have right. no idea what title this is coming out of. Uh, that came out of one of the crossovers, um, Civil War. I'm oh, so pretty this sure. This is harkening back to Civil War? Yes. Now, is, 
This yeah, there was a mini series. Okay, that was not not the Civil War. You mean some side mini series? Yeah, it was a. It wasn't the main series. It was a side Marvel Boy mini series. I'm pretty sure. Okay. Because yeah, I, I'm just I'm not at all familiar with this character. Um, and I and for this Mighty Avengers issue, I needed a lot more help than what Bendis provided. <laughs> right. Plus the the page in in Mighty Avengers 19 with the same dialogue as the one page of Secret Invasion 1 um it's drawn quite a bit differently and Marvel Boy has longer hair than he did in Secret Invasion 1 even though the, it's the exact same <laughs> scene. Well, they I mean that happened they did that uh, I think a few one or two times in Civil War as well they had they gave the same scene to a different artist and uh, they use the same dialogue but uh, it looks a little bit different sometimes a lot different <laughs> mm-hmm. and uh, yeah I think style wise I think Marvel tends to let you know I mean maybe DC too uh, you know let there be a little bit of interpretation I mean the whole uh, the secret invasion Runaways Young Avengers miniseries is all drawn like an animated show, like Japanese animation. Mm. And so, so the, all the scrolls look cute. <laughs> 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 they, they don't look very scary <laughs> or scrolly, really. They look kind of cute. Mm. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I could have, I sort of am missing again the old uh, footnotes that they used to do, like, you know. I know, C, editor. C, you know, C, yeah, Secret Invasion 1, or C, Marvel yeah. Boy miniseries or something. Yeah, there needs to be no, more snarky editor comments like there used to be. Uh-huh. I mean, I they they might say, well, you could just look him up on Wikipedia, but the name Marvel Boy never appeared in this issue. I wouldn't have known who to, who to Google, you know? Right, right, <laughs> right. No, that's a good point, though. I mean, yeah, there's... So far, it's like I'm I'm enjoying uh, the art quite a bit of the main series, mm-hmm. and also uh, the the two Avengers books. The art's been pretty uh, good. I've really in, what I really enjoyed from the get go from the first series was watching uh, Reed Richards be splattered <laughs> <laughs> and spread like peanut butter. It was that was awesome. <laughs> you know, I'm still, you know, after uh, Civil War, I guess I still have residual bad feelings about the... <laughs> Reed and Tony about and... Stark and Reed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've been wondering, that you know, for the most part, they have not explained yet uh, what happened to the people who the, the scrolls replaced. I know, and you know what? I'm a little bit worried because, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, when uh, Jessica Drew came back, I was the happiest, uh, the happiest fanboy out there because Spider Woman was the first series I ever read in a row, and I only read the eight, the first eight issues uh, that were uh, made into a little paperback, and so I never got the chance to be disillusioned with you know with all the crap that came later (laughs) so for me you know she's always been kind of stuck in my brain and i've always liked the original spider woman so i was really glad to have her back with her regular powers and blah 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 and and she's a scroll (laughs) so i'm hoping that you know she's not dead yeah well and you know I'm just thinking, like the characters who are who were replaced, like Jarvis and Dum Dum Dugan and Hank Pym. I can't see that they would that they would kill those characters off. All, but on the other hand, I mean, it seems well, like the most logical well, thing I, for the scrolls to do. I mean, why well, kidnap them? You know, why not just kill them? You know. Yeah. Well, it's uh, unfortunately in today's comic <laughs> book they. They do kind of kill pretty easily mm. when you know there was always some kind of uh you know in the old days of uh 
comics and even radio and all that kind of thing, you never really questioned <laughs> when they found them alive, stored, you know, oh, they were going to eat us later, you well, know, something like that. like virtually no one ever died, you know, in... If if nine eleven had happened in a nineteen seventies Marvel comic, no one would have died. <laughs> the World Trade Center would have been destroyed, but no one would have died. I mean that you know, whenever there was like a fire or disaster, you could always rely on the hero to say, Well, it's a good thing no one was hurt, you know. <laughs> well, I think that's almost kind of the what the problem that they had with uh with what to do with the heroes nowadays is because uh They've brought a lot more reality into it, and it's hard for a hero like Captain America to kind of be valid in that kind of world where sometimes the hero doesn't win. Mm -hmm. You know, because he's got to be the guy that always wins and always finds the way to save the day without getting, you know, without bringing himself down to the level of the enemy. Well, of course, now now we have a new Cap who carries a gun, so it's (laughs) different, you know. Maybe it's not Steve Rogers' world anymore, but uh, <clears throat> maybe Bucky fits into it better. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's kind of what the whole. Uh, even though we're talking about Marvel, I mean, it's kind of what the whole uh, the DC thing was. I thought was it was going to be about uh, when they. What was it? The uh, I'm already getting all the DC titles confused as well. <laughs> um, the what was it? <laughs> The one where they had the Superboy Prime is going to come back with the original Earth 2 Superman, and they were going to bring, they were going to make the Earth an, a much nicer and, uh, you know, 1950s. I thought they were going to use that and actually use it to take a little bit of the darkness out of what's so inundated with, uh, with comics. And then, of course, the character puts his fist through someone's face, and I went, oh, there went that plan. <laughs> So, <laughs> so yeah. I mean, I still, you know, even though I'm, I, I like a higher level of writing that doesn't, you know, talk down to, talk down to me as a comic reader. I still, you know, I would, I don't mind my comics being all ages. You know, my superhero comics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, when when Marvel first so, got rid of the comics code. I felt like some of the writers just kind of went over the top on purpose, and there was some really senseless violence in some of those issues at that time. They've kind of recovered from that now, but there was some really... Like, do you remember <clears throat> uh, Thunderbolts? For um, for a while, they tried it, like, with... They completely got rid of all the Thunderbolts characters, and they had, like, some kind of a fight club type story and they called it thunderbolts for some strange reason and huh. i saw the you know the preview of it and i thought no this is just you know it was just like the point of it was to have um you know blood and crime and you know it just i don't know it didn't appeal to me at all anyway and no. and and it died after about 3 or 4 issues that's good it's like i I don't know. Maybe it's it's me. I mean, I never back in the '80s. I was not a big uh, Punisher fan or Wolverine fan or any of the or Badger or any of the you know the ultra violent. Mm-hmm. I liked that kind of character done as parody. <laughs> you know, uh, because I thought it was ridiculous how how popular it was. You know, it said just said something really sad <laughs> to me about. Uh, uh, and unfortunately, um, Wolverine has become very easy to parody these days. I think. <laughs> I mean, all you, all you need is a comment about the fact that he's in practically every comic that Marvel publishes, <laughs> <laughs> and have him say "bub" a lot. <clears throat> the funniest thing is like uh, about these uh, these series, though these uh, crossovers that they've done over the last, last couple of years, is that. Uh, I really liked the Punisher ones, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because, uh, I mean, World War Hulk was, I mean, Planet Hulk for me was the best Marvel comic to come out in a long, long time. And uh, it was just awesome. And I was, you know, I 
I went through the whole gamut of emotions, you know, I was angry, I was sad, I was, you know, I'm mean, happy. And, uh, but when he, when the Hulk came to attack Earth, for me, mm-hmm. the Punisher issue was one of my favorites. Oh. Uh, he puts on this, uh, Venom type armor and, uh, he's got all this new tech and he goes to town and it's just a really, a fun, exciting <laughs> thing that was a good break from a lot of the uh, doom and gloom. Mm. You know, because there tends to be like, oh, you've got the main series and uh, which, you know, things tend to spiral down, spiral down until like the last couple issues you start to see some hope. Mm-hmm. And you've got... Front line, which would be following it from the human perspective, mm-hmm. and it always somehow is depressing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this time, front line doesn't seem to be as, you know, near as uh, important mm. as it has been in the other ones. Yeah, well, I, I've never read any of the front line series for Civil War or, or uh, World War Hulk. I'm trying to trying to keep my cost down. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, I'm glad that they that you don't really have to read everything. Mm-hmm. But like you said, for the if they don't give us a little bit of, you know, information about who these people are, then mm-hmm. you will find yourself kind of looking around. Yeah, well, I mean, I think this this structure of of event like they've done the past few times, I guess starting with House of M where there was a kind of a basic, you know, the main series, and then, you know, s- s- had some effects on other titles and whatever. I think right. maybe it works somewhat better than the way they used to do it. Um, <clears throat> there was that event, I forgot what it was called now, uh, maybe about eight years ago, where uh, <clears throat> the, I think it was the Kree turned Earth into a prison planet, Remember that one? No. Um, and there were a couple of individual issues that were just, you know, that title, which escapes me now. But but ma- basically the story ran through the other books. And, you know, you had to pick up this issue of Spider-Man and that issue of Captain America. Right, 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 and right. That's a real pain it- in the neck because then you have to... Like especially even if you're like me, where you're subscribing, then you have to make make sure that you get those individual issues of those things you don't normally read. Exactly. Where this way is somewhat better. You can choose like, okay, I'm going to subscribe to the main title, Secret Invasion, but I'm not going to get anything else extra, and it right. mo- mostly works. Yeah. But the, on the uh, other hand, excuse me. <clears throat> the other okay. hand, I think. Um, it can make the main title can end up being a little messy because it's dealing with so many different storylines. Well, yeah, they it, it's like if they they want all the books to be involved in the story, mm-hmm. and so they and they want every story to be important to the main story. Mm-hmm. So that means the main story has to touch on all these other things. Yeah, and I think that's part of the reason I didn't get Marvel Boy because he's had so few pages in the main series. Right. There's the one page in issue one and a couple pages in issue six and a panel in issue seven. <laughs> um, but he's not really a likable character, and he's not a you know. It's uh, I read the whole I read the mini series and uh, because I you know just being the completest and. Mm-hmm. But I, yeah, I never latched on to him mm. as a character. It's pretty forgettable. So there's things I have to admit now mm-hmm. that I'm reading the invasion that I'm just kind of trying to get through it as possible. I've never been a big fan of Ms. Marvel. But, yeah, um, Mighty Avengers 19 seems to be implying that maybe Marvel Boy is going to uh, become Captain Marvel. Yeah, well, Captain Marvel was never a, a big, you know, I never, 
Uh, do you like Captain Marvel? Well, I don't know. I mean, he's been dead for so long. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, back I'm, I was in high school when they published that uh, you know graphic novel of his death, right. and I I had not been very familiar with him up to that point, and you know since then I haven't really cared because he's gone. But yeah, I mean, it's pretty much the same with me. So it's I'm not you know. I think if the scrolls are to be defeated and if it, if I think there's it's okay if like Captain Marvel comes back if he's like a part of it but if it's not the earth heroes that you know that do it mm-hmm. it's it's just not worth it you know saved from by an outside power that means basically we we're powerless mm-hmm. <laughs> you know so yeah, I hope it's you know it's not heading that kind of direction, uh, but I think you know a lot of the skull defectors and uh, other alien, of course, has has got to have a part in it. But uh, basically, it's got to be the you know the Earth heroes taking care of the threat, mm. or it just won't be satisfying. Yeah, yeah. One other thing I had to say about it about Secret Invasion was that I'm having a little trouble buying the idea that this all goes back to revenge for Reed Richards turning the scrolls into cows. <laughs> I mean, that was so long ago. And, you know, I think that's, no, no, I don't think the whole thing is that, but I, I do remember one of the scrolls mentioning that that was a relative of his. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's been mentioned a number of times in, in the story, I think. Oh, I see. Um, the, uh, I was just, I just ran across it in what was it maybe issue five or six where the Jessica Drew scroll says uh, to Reed Richards that you shouldn't have turned our relatives in, into or our, <laughs> our brothers into cows. You know the according to uh, the initiative issue, those cows were turned into hamburger meat, and the people who ate them, uh, some developed power, some got sick and died. <laughs> <laughs> And the two and the, the two of the guys who ate the meat and liked the meat are uh, formed the uh, scroll kill crew. Scroll and, kill crew. Yes, and they actually eat after they kill squirrels. They eat their meat because they number one they like the taste. Number two, it helps them see squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was like, I was thinking, what really? What have comics come to? Is it <laughs> to come to? Is this is this how low we've? <laughs> yeah, because I actually want those I want those ratings back on the comics again. You know, I mean, I feel like I feel like bring back Wortham. You know, <laughs> we're in trouble. <laughs> so, what else are you reading? Uh, well, well, I was just gonna say that. Uh, mm. I remember the the only Fantastic Four issue I ever owned, and it was a Super Scroll uh, issue, and I thought that was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> I've always liked the Scrolls, and I always thought they were cool. And now that they have, uh, they showed a lot of the heroes in kind of Scroll face. Mm-hmm. I realized that I have a major thing for green chicks. <laughs> I think it started back with the Orion Slave Girl from Star Trek, but uh, definitely green chicks. There's something. <laughs> so, so are you a She-Hulk reader then? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. She-Hulk is a hottie. She-Thing, however, not a hottie. Just to, just to let you know. Yeah, I've run across the, that. That happened during a, a period when I wasn't reading comics, but I've seen a few of those back issues of, like that woman who got Ben Grimm's powers. That's bizarre. <laughs> now, with the right artist, she could still be hot. Mm-hmm. I suppose. <laughs> she come, I mean, I don't know how, how old that character was supposed to be, but as things, she looks like she's about 65. Yeah. <laughs> it's really hard to do. If you do the same exact rock effect, there's no way to to pretty it up. Yeah, to make it look feminine. Uh, what else am I reading? Mm. Uh, 
Um, well, I was really into the Exiles for a while. I just I kind of lost track. But that is a series that I'd like to go back and uh, rediscover. Now that's uh, an X Men related title, right? I, I haven't, it is. I haven't read that it before. is, but it's. Uh, but I've always. I've not. I've always never been. You know, I've never gotten on the the mutant bandwagon, and in fact, it was only because I was a big fan of Alpha Flight mm-hmm. that uh, I ever started reading any X Men mm-hmm. because they kept showing up. And, uh, but I did, you know, I did enjoy what, what I read, but, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm, I've been debating whether to keep reading the X-Men titles I'm reading or not. Actually, I, I pulled the plug on X-Men Legacy. Um, I just, it's just way too into the whole X-Men history thing that I really don't care about that much. Right. Um, I'm still reading Uncanny. Well, I tell you what I uh yeah, their whole part of the in the Civil War was I don't know. Well, yeah, the X Men they really never get too involved in the other events. The X Men have their own events <laughs> their own private events and they don't invite <laughs> the other heroes. So the heroes don't invite X Men either. I mean they'll have the obligatory X Men Secret Invasion mini series, but it doesn't really have any importance in continuity right 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 it's funny though even though i i didn't like uh wolverine much in the 80s i uh i I often liked him as when he would show up in other books you know just to add that i don't know a little bit of gravitas or something i don't know (laughs) (laughs) old fart you know he adds that right touch of old fart Mm -hmm. but uh (laughs) Have you have you have you seen the the cable series that's going on now? I haven't. I've actually I've been. I was uh, hoping you were going to tell me about a little bit about it. I did uh, during Civil War. I have to admit, I did like the uh, kind of cable Deadpool uh, balance there. Ah, uh, you know, yeah, that, that that was a good series. Cable Deadpool. Um. So yeah, well, the the cable series. Uh, that, that they're doing now uh, spun out of the uh, Messiah Complex event in the X-Men titles. Um, and <clears throat> the the Messiah Complex thing was all about this uh, mutant baby that was born who's being treated like sort of a mutant messiah. But And Cable and Bishop both know something about her, but we still don't really know what the deal is with her. Um, <clears throat> so, but Bishop, in Bishop's timeline, uh, this baby grows up to be someone who causes all of the, uh, the, <clears throat> the basically enslavement of mutants that happens. So he, he wants to kill this baby. And, but Cable sees her as a force for good and he's trying to protect her. Um, so that's basically the conflict that's, that's, uh, driving the cable series. Oh, and, that's and, actually kind of interesting. And, uh, they're, they're traveling, there's a lot of time travel in it. Um, and, you know, Bishop is trying to, just basically chasing cable through time, but now cable's time travel apparatus will only move him forward. He can't go back in time anymore. Um, now, uh, Bishop is, has now ended up in, in the present and, uh, Scott Summers is interrogating him. Um, now I, w- I was on the verge of dropping this series. I was getting kind of bored with it and I don't really like the art. Uh, the art is by uh, a guy named Olivetti is his last name. Oh, yeah. Ariel, Ariel, Ariel Olivetti. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes and nice. it's One the kind of uh, painted look that just strikes me as like too stiff and shiny. They, the figures look kind of like action figures. Um, but it's funny. I have me intrigued because Olivetti is one of my favorites. Oh, he, yeah. he was 
doing the the Punisher War Journal. Mm, okay. But now issue seven of Cable suddenly got me more engaged in the series. I don't know if it was the fact that there's some humor in it or what, but I finally started getting into the story with this one. Um, it's it, yeah, I'm I'm finally getting interested. So yeah, because Cable himself is not really the funny, quip cracking. No, yeah, Bishop has a, a couple of good lines. Um, when uh, Scott and uh, White Queen are interrogating him, he says, "Oh, so this is uh, good cop, hot cop." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one thing that you know, one thing that I have to say is that you can say anything you want about uh, JMS, mm-hmm. the guy who's writing the Spider-Man, is that uh, he really, I really liked how he wrote uh, Spider-Man's dialogue. Mm-hmm. You know, because uh, I'd never really laughed out loud <laughs> that much at uh, superhero comics, but uh, every once in a while, Spidey would say something, and it would kind of, you know, get mm-hmm. me dead. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, and and Bendis writes really funny Spider-Man uh, in in New Avengers. Yeah, Bendis is pretty funny. He's uh... <laughs> um, but yeah, JMS on Spider-Man. At the beginning, I really liked him, and at the end, I really didn't like him. <laughs> I, it just seemed like it got worse and worse as time went on. And I don't know if how much of that at the end was that they were. I it felt like they were in, intentionally driving it into a hole so that they could do the brand new day thing. And you know, one more day, I still think was kind of a stupid idea. But I don't know. Have you been reading it since then? No, it's like I, I kind of lost. <laughs> I, I wasn't one of these guys who said I'm never going to read them again. It's just that, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I'm going to leave it for a while. Because <laughs> you know, uh, like, like, damn it, it's actually been good. You know, the I mean, I I really thought it was stupid the way they changed the timeline, but. The result has been some really interesting stories, and the the brain trust, as they say, of four or five writers who were working together on it um, really set up uh, a lot of different subplots and things that are kind of building up for future storylines. It's in kind of a com- complex uh, situation that's been interesting. Well, it's I. I thought you know. I mean, I thought that uh, resetting Spider-Man, a, an idea, as an idea, it's not a bad idea. I just mm. don't like the way they did it. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think, yeah, when you have that much uh, backstory, mm-hmm. you know, there's how are you going to get, you know, how are you going to get people to just jump in and, you know, be able to feel comfortable? It's like, I know that, like, I know what it's like it, for a soap opera. You watch it for three days and you're in, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, comics can be like that. You know, you jump in and you just keep going and you, someone comes up and you read those little uh, editor notes that say, see Spider-Man number 175 or something like that. And, mm-hmm. And you go, oh, okay, it's from the past. But uh, I was thinking about this, why American comics don't do well over here in Japan. Mm. And that's the reason. Backstory? Is there just too much? Well, you know, that's the same reason that they don't go... One reason they don't go mainstream either, because you, know, you, you have to get so much background to understand the stories. I mean, you're... I understand that you've got all this, uh, you know, you've got all this story, and you want, and the people who have been reading it for years, you know, you can't just say, "All right, screw you, it's over." <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, you still got to please these people, but I don't know. Maybe let the story end a couple times, start it over. Yeah, well, I mean, I can see how re- rebooting Spidey as they did. Um creates a good jumping on point for new readers 
but for the old readers there, it creates kind of a confusion like so what things in the past really did happen and what didn't yeah well it was just the way they did it it's uh, like you know um, so and that, now the past has become kind of a mystery um, and you know we're not sure what stories have been written out of continuity and now recently they've been doing this weird thing where they've been hinting that uh, well, just uh, here and there occasionally and vaguely hinting that a few of the characters remember how things used to be and I can't remember where it was but Pete, Peter Parker implied that at some point and just recently um, Norman Osborn said something also that made it sound as if he remembered the pre-reboot world um, so you know in in the since um, Brand New Day um, Harry Osborn is alive again and uh, Norman says to him uh well, so, okay, Harry is complaining that what Norman did uh, could have killed him, and he said, well, don't act like you haven't died before. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, I can't imagine what else that could mean other than that Harry used to be dead. <laughs> well, it can... It but, came in the says, You know what? I, looking at uh, some of the things that happened in Civil War, I think sometimes Marvel is just sloppy. Mm -hmm. You know, continuity was. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, if if that is what they're doing, and they're implying that some characters, you know, know know about the change, I'm not sure what the point of that is because I I have trouble imagining now that they're going to undo it at some point and say, okay, now we're back to everybody knows that Peter Parker is Spider Man. And Aunt May is on her deathbed, and and we're back to Peter Parker has broken all these laws to to uh, save Aunt May and protect his identity or whatever. I I I don't really want to go back to that situation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, didn't she die once anyway? Oh, geez, several times. <laughs> uh -oh. Well, yeah, don't go back. Don't remind me of that time when she, <laughs> when we thought that she had died in the clone story. <laughs> oh, I, didn't I, know I was that. angry. I was angry about that one. The clone, the whole clone thing. Yeah, I read it. I read about that after the fact. The only uh, I remember. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I never got into the clone saga. I was a little bit interested in. Uh, Venom, only because I just remembered reading in Secret Wars when Spider-Man used the costume machine. I got that nifty black costume. Uh, mm -hmm. After the second Spider-Woman got one first. So basically his design was after her, her design. Uh, I'd forgotten about that, that the, the second Spider-Woman got a, a black costume also. No, she started with a black costume. She started with a black costume, but did, did she? She didn't get that from the Secret War, did she? No, I'm pretty. Unless my memory is failing, I'm pretty sure she said no. I just got it from this nifty costume making machine right here. Why don't you try it? <laughs> <laughs> then he he put it on as well, and mm -hmm. uh, but, but for some her... reason his was a uh, alive and hers wasn't. Yeah, hers was not a symbiote. Yeah, I think hers is made in Taiwan or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm glad that she's still around, though, the second one. Her name is uh, Arachne, I think, now. Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. She was in the Omega Flight miniseries. Yeah, I was a little interested in that just because, like I said, I'm a, I was an Alpha Flight fan. Sasquatch. Mm. I like Sasquatch. Mm. Yeah, well, and I'm uh, still disappointed that Bendis killed off, you know, uh, Puck and some of the other, you know, characters. Now don't forget, kill off has very little meaning. <laughs> True, and it may turn out that they were all scrolls. We don't know. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, but, you know, because Sasquatch has been gone and come back and gone and come back, and I'm just, you know, 
keep them around for me. I'm I'm secure enough in my manhood that I can say that I like big furry guys. <laughs> Well, you know, the last two times that they tried to have an Alpha Flight series, I don't know why it was, but in both cases, the writers seemed to want to introduce new characters and shortchange some of the old ones. And I was like, I mean, we wanted to see the old ones. That was why we were buying the series. Yeah. And I didn't really see the need to bring in different characters. Maybe they just didn't know what to do with, with Shaman. <laughs> Well, I think going back and looking back at the old issues, I think that they, from the beginning, they messed with the ranks a little bit too much, Mm. you know, because I think they had a really good balance Mm -hmm. and there was still a lot. I think it's just there's not enough people in Canada to fight against because there's only like eight people living there (laughs) and they all live on the border. (laughs) You know, and uh, they're always asking for cigarettes. It's, you know, it's... <laughs> Good day, eh? <laughs> no, I kid the Canadian people. <laughs> but they're like scrolls, you know? You can't really tell. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's so like when a Canadian from. guy walks up to you and says, uh, he loves you, and then you got to run for cover. Yeah, it's like, where are you from? Uh, Minnesota, eh? And you're yeah. like, hmm, really? <laughs> really? So, yeah. <laughs> no offense to any listeners we might have in Canada. <laughs> we love the Canadians. We love them. We just don't invade us. Because <laughs> we won't be able to tell you apart. <laughs> I'd really like to go back to Toronto someday. I was there once a long time ago. But... I've only been in, uh, I've only been to Vancouver, and uh, I have to admit, I had a great time. It was, a, it was a good three days. I started uh, I started across the border thinking I could drive 100 miles per hour mm-hmm. and then realized it was kilometers. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't John Byrne from Canada? Yes. I seem to remember him uh, doing some Canadian. Well, that's why. That's well, that why where the Alpha Flight came from. Right? Yeah, that's why. You know. Yeah. Well, I seem to remember an issue of X-Men where it was like in Vancouver or something and he was you know, drawing all the local sites in the story. I don't know. That was a long time ago. Yeah, it's uh yeah, a lot of uh a lot of cool people from Canada. It's like I'm 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 really glad I mean, we're we're kind of off on the tangent, but I'm really glad that uh that uh, William Shatner is uh doing well. <laughs> <laughs> he was able to reinvent himself. I think that's good. Even though you know, a lot of his uh, former uh, co-workers are not not very happy with the man. But uh, <laughs> yeah, um, so, let's see. What oh, I I went to you know I went to Comic Con last year, and I'm try I'm going to go again next year. Mm-hmm. If you had a chance to meet the one artist and one writer, who who do you think you'd like to meet? Hmm. I don't know. Artist, maybe. John Romita Jr. Um, writer, I suppose Ben does. Yeah, I, uh, for Marvel, hmm, I wonder. I, you know, actually, I, I do like Olivetti's stuff a lot. To tell you the truth, hmm. uh, ever since he started, uh, first thing I saw him in was uh, the DC Haven debacle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not a DC reader at all, so I'm not familiar with that. But it's a really funny and sad story. Uh, these fans pitched an idea to DC uh, because one of the heroes, probably Green Arrow, their whole city was – no, no, no. It was a former Green Lantern. His city was demolished. Mm-hmm. And so they had this big hole. <laughs> and this uh, escaping alien prison barge uh, is taken over by the prisoners who are basically their f- you know they want freedom they're un they're not cri- really criminals they're not really bad people they want to be they just want to be free mm-hmm. and so they crash that whole city this city ship down where that city used to be mm-hmm. 
and they were going to weave it into the fabric of the DC universe. And so they started with a uh, a mini series, and then you know they were going to have the characters, I guess, slowly come into the DC universe and hopefully be a permanent part. Mm-hmm. But now you don't hear anything about those guys. <laughs> And uh, but it was I mean it was a good story I enjoyed it and I was looking forward to more and it was just like uh, now we have another hole. <laughs> <laughs> but w- once they did that, then no writer wanted to do anything more with it. I guess. Huh? Yeah. So what's the thing with the Colbert for president stuff always kind of showing up in the Marvel books? I don't know. Do I have- guess Quesada, uh, Joe Quesada met Colbert or something and he he decided that he was going to have Colbert for president stuff in the Marvel books. That was that was Casada's idea, I think. I can't because remember where I heard that now, but because even on the uh, marvel.com website there's something there's a Colbert for president. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and, uh, and apparently and, there was a comic, I see. In in Amazing Spider-Man 573 there was this backup story of uh, Colbert running for president and meeting Spider-Man. And <laughs> Man, that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, here it is. Spider-Man, Stephen Colbert team up. Yeah, I think the story might be on the website. Yeah, it is right here. J. Jonah Jameson's <laughs> presenting him a check. That's funny. Because he's definitely been, it's been showing up in the, uh, in the invasion stuff as well. Yeah, yeah, there's a Colbert poster here and there. Um, I don't know what that connection was. Well, I don't want to go too much longer here uh, because uh, GarageBand won't let me fit it all in. I have to cut stuff like I did last time. Right. But um, how's your uh, comics career going? Well, I'm working on uh, an anthology, which I will edit. And I've written several stories for it, and I'm trying to get uh, some Japanese artists and American writers and uh, to put a book together that we will go to Comic-Con next year mm-hmm. and uh, shop around, mm-hmm. uh, basically, you know, to try to get some kind of context and uh, contacts in the industry, mm-hmm. um, you know, get, at least show our work out there, get our work out there, mm-hmm. show people what we can do. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, you know, who knows? And I've, it's actually been good exercise for me because I've been doing mostly illustration mm-hmm. uh, the last uh, couple of years. And now that I'm starting to write more, it's getting me back into a comics frame of mind. Mm-hmm. So, are, are you going to uh, Comic Market in Tokyo in December? Yes, yes. I have a new issue of my, uh, my fanzine, Fan Domain, out. Um, I usually put some kind of details on my home page, patocon.com. So you're breaking curious. up. You're breaking up a little bit. A bit. That's uh, pat, patocon.com, right? P a t o k o n. Yeah, p a t o k o n dot com. Yeah. yeah. And okay. uh, yeah, so I usually put details up there, but uh, I'll be putting out another uh, printing of the American Comic Book Sound Effect Dictionary, which I've which still is po- seems to be popular. People are still asking me <laughs> about it. So, yeah, yeah. Um, Mulele and Patrick G and I were often talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I still, you know, I tell people about. It. I still get a lot of uh, interest in it from uh, artists and designers. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of interesting. And I I have yet to do any updates to it, which I'd like to start doing. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, it's got to be a lot of work to, com- to compile all that. Yeah, it took about a year and a half to get uh, that much uh, what's in it already. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just, uh, I had just going through comics and picking out like unusual sound effects, right? Well, I went through. I basically picked up all the sound effects that I came across in all the uh, in a a lot of the comics that I thought were, uh, I don't know, had some kind of historical significance. Mm-hmm. You know, I couldn't go through every possible comic ever, but uh, 
I went through quite a few of the ones which I thought were important in comics history. Mm -hmm. Um, And I only went up to basically the 70s so far. Mm -hmm. I see. So, yeah, so now I'm going through. Because now sound effects are used a lot more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and and they they uh, make up a lot of new ones too. Instead of maybe relying on the old standbys like Crash and Boom, you know. So. What's interesting is that I actually learned a little bit about uh, the English language while I was mm-hmm. doing that research, mm-hmm. and uh, saw how you can't totally divorce sound from meaning. Mm-hmm. So it was, yeah, it was quite. Uh, it's actually quite interesting if you're into, you know, studying language, mm-hmm. primitive language. <laughs> <laughs> well, and um, if you go, you know, I I heard that they recently put out a hardcover of the of Howard Jenkins' American Flag series from the '80s. Right, right. And uh, he, he used he really got made you know had fun with sound effects in that. Um, I remember there was one place where the shooting of a gun went chaka 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 con. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was a he was a he's a character. <laughs> okay, well, um, that should be about enough uh, for 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 one time, but we should do this again. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, it's good talking about this stuff, and uh, uh, apologies again to our friends from Canada. (laughs) (laughs) Be sure to check out Patrick Washburn's latest projects at patokon.com. That's P-A-T-O-K-O-N.com. Give us your feedback. What would you like us to talk about? Who would you like us to interview? Write us at mail at deconstructingcomics.com or post on our blog at deconstructingcomics.com. A listener named Kamar left a note on the blog last week. He wrote, A big thanks to Tim and friends for producing one of the best podcasts on the net. The relaxed but informative style is addictive, and I always eagerly look forward to the next one. Keep it up. Thanks, Kamar. We're trying. In addition to emailing and posting on the blog, we'd especially appreciate our listeners posting reviews of this podcast on iTunes. And if you think our interviews, reviews, and general comics-related discussion is worth some cold, hard cash to you, feel free to send us some. It helps us pay for the web hosting so we don't have to wash cars on Saturdays. Use the PayPal link at deconstructingcomics.com. Deconstructing Comics is brought to you by comicsnow.com. Subscribe to all your favorite series from Comics Now and get 35% off the cover price and off of any other books you order. Comics Now provides many of the comics we review on this show. Read Eric's newsletter on our site, deconstructingcomics.com, to see this month's pick, which will be 50% off to Comics Now subscribers. Here at Deconstructing Comics, we're trying to produce the best comics podcasts on the net. We don't dwell on this week's mainstream comics. Since we're in Japan, that would be difficult. And anyway, there's so much more to comics than that. We're trying to go beyond what others are doing by talking about creating comics and also looking at the comics medium from unusual angles. For example, next week's show. We'll be talking about the effects that comics have had on live drama. Austin Titchener from the Reduced Shakespeare Company will be here to talk about how comics have influenced him as both an actor and a playwright. And, by the way, why is it that newspaper comics always seem to be adapted as musicals? Till next time, thanks so much for listening. This is Tim. See you next week on Deconstructing Comics. 